Okay, hello and welcome. This will be the second video in the internal medicine series for clinical clerkships. Today we will be discussing type 2 renal tubular acidosis, also known as the proximal renal tubular acidosis. If you have not had a chance to watch the type 1 renal tubular acidosis video, please go back and do it now because some of the in information does carry over. So once again, we see that this is a classification scheme for type 1, type 2, and type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Um, today we'll not be focusing so much on type 4, we'll mainly be looking at the differences between type 1 and type 2, and also we'll be explaining the pathophysiology behind why, for instance, the urine pH will be less than 5.5, why the bicarb isn't as uh, low as in type 1 RTA, um, why the citrate will be high, for instance. So let's start by looking at the defect in type 2 renal tubular acidosis. So the defect, the hallmark defect, remember guys, every time we're looking at the electrolyte abnormality somewhere along the lines that um, we'll be able to use to classify uh, type 2 renal tubular acidosis, always ask yourselves, why is that happening? And remember, it always comes back to the central hallmark defect, an impaired proximal bicarbonate reabsorption, okay? So knowing that, let us move on to here we see that this is the primary step where it happens, right? The early proximal tubule, as the name suggests, the proximal um, renal tubular acidosis, it occurs from the proximal tubule and all the way until the end of the distal tubule. So all of this, uh, this uh, along this area right here, there is a defect in the reabsorption of bicarb. So without getting into too much detail, um, let's go through this, this scheme right here. So first, um, this is step one right here, right? So we see that sodium must be um, transported actively using ATP energy across the um, border, the basal lateral membrane, okay? And going into the interstitium, and this creates a net negative gradient for sodium. Now, this allows for the passive reabsorption of sodium from the urine in exchange for a proton. So remember what happens here, guys. A proton is basically being excreted, and in the end, we have a net gain of bicarb into the body, okay? Um, so Let's get back to this step right here. The proton is excreted, combines with a bicarb anion, which will be brought in, right? Combines as carbonic acid and through the help of carbonic anhydrase, right? And this carbonic acid goes back in. There's another uh, intracellular carbonic anhydrase that basically allows to break down into this anion right here, which is the bicarb, right? And the excess um, H plus is now excreted um, as glutamine which is going to be turned into ammonium. So to make things very simple, we see that we are able to excrete a proton, which essentially allows us to bring in one extra bicarbonate into the body. So remember, in type 2 renal tubular acidosis, somewhere along the way of step 1, step 2, or step 3, somewhere along the lines here, one of these steps or a combination of these steps are broken, not allowing us to reabsorb bicarbonate back into the body. So let's talk about the urine pH. The urine pH differs from type 1 renal tubular acidosis. And remember, in type 1 renal tubular acidosis, um, the, the urine pH is greater than 5.5. Here is less than 5.5. So we must ask, so ask ourselves why. So to understand that, we have to come back to this step right here. Remember, so this is the proximal, right? And this is the distal. Remember, in type 1 renal tubular acidosis, this is the this is the, uh, the, the, the step where it occurs is in the junction of the distal tubule and the early collecting duct. And remember, I also mentioned that it is in this step that is very high yield, that this is the most distal step that allows for the acidification of urine via the HK ATPase. Remember that. So in type 2 renal tubular acidosis, although the body is in a state of uh, acid, ac in an acidotic state, it's still able to compensate somewhat because the most distal mechanism for uh, acid excretion is intact. And because of that, it's able to acidify the urine with protons. And because of that, we see that the urine pH will be less than 5.5, okay? Next, let's take a look at the urine anion gap. So remember the urine anion gap, the UAG, is basically defined as the urine sodium plus the urine potassium minus the urine chloride, okay? So in this case, we must ask ourselves, why would the urine anion gap be negative? So sodium and potassium are really 
not affected. So we must expect that the chloride anion is drastically increased for some reason in this um, in this defect. So to understand that, let's look at this step right here. Okay. So this is a very important step that occurs in the type B intercalated cells. Okay. And normally what happens, this is an anion exchanger. Okay. It's an AE1 class of proteins that allows the exchanging of chloride and bicarbonate. However, remember in this case, so normally what happens is the bicarb gets shunted out in exchange for a reabsorption of a chloride anion. However, remember the defect in type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Always come back to the defect. The defect is that we are unable to reabsorb bicarb, right? So we have a lot of bicarb in the urine. So because of that, we see that this process no longer occurs. In fact, it reverses almost. And because of that, we see that it is unfavorable for chloride to be reabsorbed because of the gradient is unfavorable. There's too much urine bicarb, right? And because of that, the chloride will tend to stay in the urine. So if we're coming back into this step right here, we see that the urine chloride is excessively high. And as a result, this all makes sense now. The urine anion gap will be negative. Next, the plasma bicarb will be roughly 15 to 18 for the most part, okay? And this isn't as severe as in type 1 renal tubular acidosis when the plasma bicarb was less than 15. So we say that this is more of a self-limiting disorder, right? And it's really self-limiting for, well, several reasons, but let's go over some of the most important reasons. So first of all, we can imagine that if we lose bicarb in the urine, what's going to happen is that the body is going to be depleted of bicarb. And when that happens, autoregulatory mechanisms begin to begin to occur. The body realizes that, okay, the, the bicarb load within the body is decreased. So what happens is it begins delivering, the body begins to deliver less bicarb, okay, into the glomerulus. And less of it will be filtered and less of it will, will be presented to the proximal tubule. So because of that, we see that the urine bicarb will not be as low as it would be normally. There's another reason for why the plasma bicarb will be not as low as usual. And we see that, remember, the plasma bicarb is basically also a measure of the amount, the proton amount, or the um, acid load within the body. Remember we mentioned that in type 2 renal tubular acidosis, the mechanism right here that allows for the acidification of urine is intact. So because of that, we're still able to concentrate the urine with acid. And as a result, the total plasma bicarb will not be as low as usual. So next, let's look at the plasma potassium. So why would the plasma potassium be low in this case? Remember, we mentioned that, perhaps we haven't mentioned it, but 90% of the bicarb is reabsorbed within the proximal tubule. So that's really most of it. And when bicarb cannot be reabsorbed along the distal, along the uh, along the tubule, um, so right about you know, if if the plasma if the if the plasma bicarb begins to decrease and we keep filtering all of this excess bicarb loss, aldosterone will be increased. Okay, because distally the aldosterone will be able to sense that okay we're losing a lot of bicarb and that's dragging in a lot of Na and a lot of Cl with it aldosterone will be increased. So remember the effect of aldosterone, right? What aldosterone does is basically allow for the reabsorption of sodium in exchange for H in exchange for K. So when you're losing this massive uh, bicarb load into the urine, aldosterone will be upregulated and these mechanisms will also be upregulated as well. So you'll be increasing the sodium reabsorption and you'll also be increasing uh, the exchange for, especially relevant in this case, potassium. And thus, we will have a low plasma potassium, right? So urine calcium, let's not worry too much about it in this case, but the primary mechanism of why urine calcium isn't too much of a problem is because um, the final urine uh, urine acidification step, as we discussed here, it's it's still present um, in type 2 renal tubular acidosis. So the body is, is in a, a less severe state of acidemia, and thus the urine sodium will be um, not too relevant in this case, primarily because the bone is not being leached as much, um, causing, causing the bone breakdown, leading to calcium deposition.
And once again, because of that stone formation will be rare. So urine citrate brings us to a very interesting next, next um, step. So why would urine citrate be high? And to understand that, we really have to realize that the association of type 2 um, RTA is very important. It's associated with Fanconi syndrome. And the defect in Fanconi syndrome is in the reabsorptive ability of the proximal tubular cells. So as you can imagine, if these PCT cells are unable to function, they are unable to reabsorb the anions, what you will have is, well, first of all, most importantly and most relevant, you'll have the proximal to, um, type 2 RTA, but you will also have hypercitraturia. So citrate normally is an anion that chelates calcium, as we mentioned last time, and is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. However, if you have Fanconi syndrome, right? You lose the reabsorptive capacity of these PCT cells, and thus you will have high citrate. In addition to that, in Fanconi syndrome, it's very high yield to know that phosphate will be low in the blood because it's unable to be reabsorbed, right? Same with glucose, other amino acids, and also proteins. So basically, the hallmark step in Fanconi syndrome is the defect in the reabsorptive ability of proximal convoluted tubular cells. In addition, Type 2 renal tubular acidosis also has several other associations that are very important to know. Um, I remember when I was studying for this as a medical, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a medical student. When I was studying for this in step one, I remember I had to memorize all of these things, but didn't really know why. And now if I broke it down to hereditary, acquired, and drugs, it makes a lot of sense. It all comes back to the central hallmark defect in type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Do you remember what that is? That's right. The central hallmark defect is the inability to reabsorb bicarbonate at the proximal convoluted tubule, right? And that results in the non-anion gap metabolic acidosis within the body as well. So let's look at hereditary, right? So remember, as I mentioned before, 90% of the bicarb is reabsorbed within the proximal convoluted tubule, and the proximal convoluted tubule is really, um, it, it relies very heavily on metabolic needs, not only for that reason, but also because it consists of the bulk of the renal mass, right? So imagine a disease like cystinosis, tyrosinemia, glycogen storage diseases, or Wilson's disease. In each of these cases, cysteine will be built up, tyrosine will be built up, right? Glycogen, glycogen will be built up and copper will be built up. And all of this basically ends up being accumulated and deposited in the proximal convoluted tubules, right? So what happens with that is it, it really hinders with the metabolism of these energy rich proximal convoluted cells and when you are when when this occurs all of these deposition creates oxidative injury because the cells can no longer meet its metabolic needs right so this accumulation needs, leads to oxidative injury and obviously when that happens the cell begins to slough off it begins to die and thus you will be losing the ability to reabsorb bicarbonate leading to type 2 RTA in addition, there are several high-yield acquired um, causes of RTA, right? You will have light chain deposition primarily is the central hallmark defect of these acquired diseases. Um, so amyloidosis and multiple myeloma. So remember the light chain, right? So the light chain ends up being deposited in, along the uh, proximal tubular cells. And normally, there, um, there are these endocytic processes within the proximal tubular cells that allows the endocytosis of light, chain light chains which are deposited, right? So that won't prevent, um, that won't hinder the function of these proximal convoluted tubular cells. However, in amyloidosis and multiple myeloma, these, um, the deposition of light chain really begins to overwhelm these, uh, the ability of the endocytic processes to kind of clear away these light chains. And as a result of that, the cells will once again slough off and die. And finally, when you're looking at drugs, the high yield association here is with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide. So with a drug like that, let's go back to this step right here. We see that if the carbonic anhydrase step is not allowed, then the carbonic acid will not be broken down into HCO and CO2 and it won't be able to um, be filtered back into the uh, proximal tubular cell, right? And because of that, you can basically see that if this step is not occurring, then we're unable to reabsorb a bicarbonate um, anion, and that will also create uh, the, once again, the central hallmark of type 2 renal tubular acidosis. And so with that, we conclude this section um, of type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Please, please stay tuned for um, the next video for type 4 renal tubular acidosis.